She's a dove, Kate went on, and one somehow doesn't think of doves as bejeweled. Yet they suit her down to the ground. Densher saw now how they suited her, but was perhaps still more aware of something intense in his companion's feeling about them. Millie was indeed a dove. This was the figure, though it most applied to her spirit. Yet he knew in a moment that Kate was just now, for reasons hidden from him, exceptionally under the impression of that element of wealth in her, which was a power, which was a great power, and which was dove-like only insofar as one remembered that doves have wings and wondrous flights, have them as well as tender tints and soft sounds. It even came to him dimly that such wings could in a given case, had, truly, in the case with which he was concerned, spread themselves for protection. Hadn't they, for that matter, lately taken an inordinate reach? And weren't Kate and Mrs. Lauder? Weren't Susan Shepherd and he? Wasn't he, in particular, nestling under them to a great increase of immediate ease? All this was a brighter blur in the general light, out of which he heard Kate presently going on. Hey everybody, how's it going? Thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf and welcome to the first official review video of 2024. And I am thrilled that I get to spend it talking about Henry James, the master, and specifically his late masterwork, The Wings of the Dove, which I have now read for the first time. This is thanks to a big time supporter, encourager, friend of the show, Jeff. Thank you so, so much for selecting this one as my first read of 2024. I actually read this while I was still in the midst of my feverish sickness that I got coming out of the holidays that I talked about in my previous video. But I found that this gave me such a great reprieve, if only a mental reprieve, from the throes of illness. I've been thinking about how in the world to talk about Henry James. This is the first time that I'm directly and deeply talking about Henry James on the channel. Henry James is one of these writers that I went through in the phases that we all kind of go through in our reading life way before or well before starting this channel. So like Hemingway, like Raymond Carver, like Faulkner, like Borges, a lot of these immersions that I've been in here and there throughout my reading life predate the channel. And so it was really nice to now get the impetus through my catalyst of Jeff to go back and revisit Henry James and bring it onto the channel. It was funny because my first encounters with James, I now cannot remember if I read the American first or the turn of the screw first. I tend to think it was the turn of the screw, which is just an outstanding novella. And I highly recommend it to any and all readers. And because I, I distinctly remember then going into the American, which is early James, and thinking, whoa, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute, where's where's the, the author from The Turn of the Screw? And I talked with a lot of people and I realized that James was something new to my diet, if you will. He was, yes, still coming out of the, the more Victorian novel era and form and mode, and yet adding this more psychological dimension for which he's still known today for a kind of spearheading psychological realism. And it, it just struck me as, as so different and just so much more dense and slowed down than even what I was used to at the time. But I was very curious and I had a lot of gusto about refining my palate, kind of like William Gass says 
in his temple of texts when he talks about, you know, if you truly want to uh, appreciate, have a deep and far ranging appreciation of literature, then kind of like the culinary arts or gastronomy, you have to start to learn to develop a palate for things that aren't immediately tasteful. You have to learn to appreciate caviar, learn to appreciate fine wines and foie gras, stuff like that. And so immediately, I guess it's not for everybody. But eventually, as I continued to read James, as I read Washington Square and Daisy Miller and revisited Turn of the Screw and revisited The American and then was taken away by the Portrait of a Lady and Isabel Archer, whose prototype, I would say, is Daisy Miller, you know, and now in The Wings of the Dove, we have Millie, who is, I think, the culmination or the, the apotheosis of this ideal and idealist American girl in Europe that was sort of the preoccupation of Henry James and his writing. But, you know, I would go on to then read The Ambassadors and The Golden Bull. And by the time I finally got to those late works, and in fact, with uh, The Wings of the Dove in there, those three late works are coming out of the time in which he finally earned that nickname that we still use today, The Master, because it's, he was just at the height of his craft. And by that time, I saw The Golden Bull, and still do, as his sort of highest artistic achievement. But all along the way, and even now, I was thinking to myself how to present James today in 2024. And I've been coming up against this dilemma a lot lately. I was at a bookstore a few months ago, and while I was browsing the stacks, there were three probably either high school or college age girls browsing the stacks nearby. And they got to the Jane Austen section and they started saying, oh, Pride and Prejudice. And all of them talked about how they had seen almost all of the different film adaptations, but not one of them had read the novel. And one of them even made the remark, at this point, why would I even read the novel? And, you know, I'm not going to get on a soapbox about film versus books because, you know, I respect people's tastes and, and pensions and propensities and so on. But it did start getting those wheels thinking like, yeah, why for generations that didn't come up through the Victorian novels, that didn't read deeply of Thomas Hardy and George Eliot and going back a little bit into, you know, Jane Austen uh, Thackeray, let's just call it the, the British style of British aestheticism from roughly 1700s to turn of the 20th century. You know, how for people who, you know, are born after the minimalists and the maximalists and the explosion of hyperactive genre fiction, what pull is there? You know, what appeal is there? And I was talking with a friend of mine who's a bit younger than me. Seems like everybody is these days, but that's another story. And it became so apparent that pretty much anything before about 1980 in his mind was just deemed outmoded, outdated, and in the end, boring. And so all these things really got me thinking about this, you know, this generational divide. And, you know, I'm not trying to say that anyone's better than anyone else. I'm just presenting the facts of, you know, as we grow up, whatever we shaped our tastes on during our formative years are kind of locked in. And for me, I, it just so happens that because of situations in my household and with the parents that I had, I very much locked in a taste for the activity of reading over and above so many other activities. And so in contrast to my friend who, when 
he is presented with a novel and where the the opening paragraph or the opening chapter clearly is written such that his reading speed has to be cut into a fraction of what it normally is this in and of itself kind of is so off-putting that the plot the character development the prose can't really overcome that whereas for whatever reason when i encounter james who honestly james's prose seems to be made to slow the world down to slow us down to slow down everything around us this to me presents an opportunity that almost makes me giddy it returns me to those early days of my reading when I could just be absorbed in a book for an entire Saturday and not be concerned with the number of pages I burn through or quickly getting to the next book in my queue. As I, I wrote in here while I was reading The Wings of the Dove, reading James slows the world down, calibrates our internal clocks, forces us back into a natural state of observation and awareness that our furiously paced, relentlessly bombarded world has rendered foreign. Now for some people, this, like me, you know, this is appealing, whereas for others, that sounds horrible. You know, why would they subject, subject themselves to grappling with the slow grind of James? So I don't have a, a, a succinct single panacea of an answer, but what I hope to do in this video is use the wings of the dove to answer and put forth why I find it so worthwhile and rewarding to put everything else aside for a while, suspend our need to adhere to the clock, to get to everything all at once, and acquiesce to the master. I will also openly admit, okay, th this book is divided into two parts or two volumes. And I will openly admit that with the wings of the dove, I went through the first volume and I honestly thought to myself, I'm not sure if I can put up with this for the next half of this book. Like it, it was a little, uh, not intense, not a slog, not demanding, but it reminded me of some of the properties of James that put me off a little bit when I first encountered him. It was almost like I was having to learn to read him, to learn to meet him where he is all over again. And honestly, th this is crazy. I even texted my friend about this the day that it happened. The day that I read or started on the second volume, it roughly halves into 200 pages and 200 pages, was a Saturday and I was still fighting sickness. So, uh, you know, I knew I wasn't going anywhere that day and I sat in my chair from 6.30 a.m. until about 5 o'clock p.m. with one break to run to the grocery store really quickly and a couple of breaks to get a snack or use the bathroom, during which most of them I continued to read the book. But I did not put that book down until I read the entirety of the second volume. And even though it's 200 pages, yes, it took me almost, let's say, nine to 10 hours to read it. Because your reading speed just has to slow down to meet James and to, to really appreciate like you would a fine wine on your palate. You don't, you know, chug down a fine wine. You, you sip on it throughout the, the meal. But I was absolutely in its grip. The first volume really sets up. If you can just commit to abandoning yourself, to suspending your judgments and your need for pace and, and quickness and ephemera for those first 200 pages, I promise you the rewards in the second volume are virtually infinite. And it sealed it for me that whereas I thought to myself, okay, this is indeed the lesser of James's late works by the end of the first volume, by the end of the second, I was singing its praises to close friends. 
And in fact, in his 1909 preface that was reissued with the New York edition of The Wings of the Dove, he says, it might have a great deal to give the book, but would probably ask for equal services in return, in meeting, in other words, asking services of the reader, and would collect this debt to the last shilling. And so he's basically just saying, listen, it, I've got a lot to give, but I need you to give too. And at this point in his career, he is a master architect of his prose. And again, this is a different prose than what a lot of us are used to now in 2024, especially those of us, including myself, who savor the postmodern masterpieces that sort of defenestrate the formal rules of proper English grammar and punctuation and so on, which, you know, James is fastidious about. He's punctilious about precision. The prose is so richly designed. He has this architecture of subordinate clauses and digressions and appositives or appositions that just naturally slow your pace down, but just build up these layers and layers of richness. William Gass, who is a great admirer of Henry James's prose, talked a lot about the architecture of James's sentences and even uh, devised his original spindle diagrams to show how that architecture was sort of designed. Like I said, James is known for being sort of the pioneer of psychological realism there heading into the modernist movement. And what that means, as best as I can describe it, because psychological can have so many different meanings. And today, with the glut of psychological thrillers and so on, some of what James does is lost. So what he does, as best as I can describe it, and I wish that I had really good videographic skills because I could make a pretty killer animation of this, but you'll have to just go with me and visualize it from my words, just like you're reading a book or an audio book, I guess that would be. But the best I can describe it is that James, with every character, and you picture these nodes, just these little nodes uh, as characters, what he does is he, around those characters, he creates these constellations that represent the psychological interiority of each of those characters. And picture those constellations kind of spread around and diffused out, emanating out from each of those points. And then what he does is he plays a sort of game of, of chess where he moves different characters and their corresponding psychological constellations into different proximities of each other. And what he does is he describes the, what should we call it, the fission, the, the interaction of the collision, the proximal collision of the different constellations from the point of view or from within the constellations themselves. These constellations comprise descriptions of their feelings, their sentiments, their histories, their socioeconomic leanings and bents, and also their ruminations. And as one critic pointed out about The Wings of the Dove, the book is made up of 50-50 presentation of conversations that take place and then descriptions of the characters running back through those conversations, just like we do in our minds throughout every day. But what's so interesting is how he's able to shift around these proximities of the character psychological constellations and present them as sort of intermingling waves with each other. And the absolute apex of what earns him the title, the master, is how he has derived how to put words to the descriptions from within and around those interacting, commingling constellations. That's the best way I can describe at a high level what he pulls off here and why 
the prose may seem so dense and slow to readers of James today. The other thing that might make James seem a little off-putting or foreign or what have you is that we're on this side of Hemingway's insistence to show, don't tell. In a way, James tells and doesn't show. Well, he kind of does both. But whereas Hemingway, and I admire Hemingway, by the way, but whereas Hemingway tries to find a language where he's just showing what's happening and letting our minds fill in the rest in such a way, how should I describe this? In such a way to where Hemingway wants you to see through the words he uses. He wants you to see through the language he's using. But for James... James is pulling off the same end result, but for James, the English language is part, is a very, is a major and beautiful part of literature, of books, of novels, of stories. And so James wants the language to be very much in your way. He doesn't want you to see straight through it. He wants the process of reading for the reader to encompass parsing the language and what's being said. Language, and even down to punctuation, I would say, for James is part of the reading experience that should absolutely be there. Sort of like admiring the brush strokes in a painting instead of seeing through the brushstrokes to just what it's a picture of. Another thing that kind of sets James apart and that you might have to learn, it might take some cultivation, is that like Colette, the French female writer, Colette, like her, James has a subtle sensuality that absolutely leans more towards the Victorian repression than anything we're used to today. The, the aggressively overt sexuality is totally subverted into a, a subtle, and I would say, I would argue, more intimate sensuality of a Colette. Okay, all right, so enough about all that. I hope that this has given you at least some ways of understanding what James does, why it may not immediately be something that you latch on to, but why it does work so well and why there are payoffs if you put in the... It's not even really work. It's more these days, I would say it's more tolerance and openness, willingness. But let me move more into what The Wings of the Dove is about. And I, I wrote some of this down, so I'm going to read from my notes. And I think to try to hook you in terms of the story and the subject matter, his question that drives this story is, what if you have everything at your disposal? Money, looks, connections, everything, except time. What if you will die very soon? How do you reach a point where you can be okay with dying because you know with confidence that you have lived and you have lived well and properly? It's a great, great question. And he has a wonderful answer that I will steer away from or at least I think it's the answer. So I'll maybe I'll wait until the very end of the video and I'll say, you know, some spoilers. But I think it's a beautiful answer. A couple of things that he's doing that he does in many of his other books, he's bringing Americans to Europe. Of course, James, who was sort of, a, he was a dual citizen of America and England. He was just as American as he was British, and he was one of our first American cosmopolitans. He's very in touch with many of the different cultures, and he says some funny things coming out 
of that awareness of different European cultures versus American, such as uh, something to the effect of, you know, this book would have been much easier if I were writing a French novel instead of a British novel, because I would just have the guy have an affair for a while with this young girl and then move on. <laughs> but with the British sentiment, he couldn't do that because that would uh, be a violation of British uh, aesthetics. He really wants to show this contrast of civilized and cultured people versus vulgar and simple. Vulgar is a, a, a loved, beloved word of James's and something that he never wants to create in his art. Americans in Europe, like I said, is his theme. But with specifically a British novel, he really wants to show this social art of dissimulation and subterfuge. Those are two main things going on in this book that drive the drama. He wants to show the importance and consequence on social life by one's decorum in the Victorian age. And as part of that, some of this recalls the way that the world is painted for us in Heian, Japan by the tale of Genji. He's got a very, very small cast of characters and the plot is pretty straightforward. And I will read through my notes where I just jotted down plot points as, as it developed. Uh, but I'll shy away from spoilers. But we start with Lionel Croy and his daughter, Kate Croy. And we won't see Lionel very much. He, he's a very minor character and is more sort of sidelined or talk, talked about obliquely than directly. But he's apparently done something unspeakable that we never learn what it is. We get hints and ideas. But he's done something that's basically driven his family into poverty. And so Kate Croy is caught between her being loyal to her father and then Maud Louder or Aunt Maud. And Lionel and Aunt Maud, they hate each other. They are totally at odds. And Aunt Maud is the one who still has a fortune and can do something for Kate. But of course, she's caught between them and basically has to choose sides. Well, then there's Merton Densher who is a young man that falls in love with Kate Croy. It seems to be mutual. They end up becoming secretly engaged and they have to play this right. Like I said, it's all about dissimulation and subterfuge, but they have to play this right to see what fortune they can possibly maneuver from Aunt Maud. Now, the problem is that in Aunt Maud's eyes, Merton Densher is a poor commoner. He works on Fleet Street in the newspaper trade as a journalist. And so he's basically, you know, just, he's got nothing <laughs> that he can do for Kate. And Aunt Maud doesn't like him for Kate at all. And because of that, and because of Aunt Maud's overbearing prowess and person, she has massive say over this thing. And so they know if they fly in her face and against her wishes, no fortune for Kate. And of course, Merton, he's not providing any fortune either. All right, so that pretty much sets up our European characters or our London figures. Swing over to New York in America, and we've got Susan Stringer. And she is she hails from Boston. She's a short story writer, and she's also the confidant pseudo caretaker and companion of Millie, young Millie Thiel. Millie Thiel is the, she, she's the main character here. She's the Daisy Miller. She's the Isabel Archer. She is James's foremost creation. And what's so interesting about her in this book is how she's rarely on stage. He uses the constellations from so many other characters to give us our image of Millie. But Millie is in an interesting position because she has inherited this enormous fortune. She's young. She's beautiful. She has all these connections. She hails from an old, rich, 
New York family, but almost everyone has passed away. So she's not beholden to any figures. So she's the antithesis of Kate Croy. Well, Susan Stringer and her friend Millie Thiel decide to travel to Europe and just take in the joys and luxuries of the old world. It turns out that there was some overlap with Millie and Merton Dencher because Merton Dencher got sent by assignment from his newspaper to do some journalism in America for a few months. And apparently they met each other a couple of times. And it turns out that Susan Stringer knows Aunt Maud. They go back. And so one thing leads to another, and Susan Stringer apparently has some envy and wants to show off her sort of possession of Millie Thiel, or maybe not possession, but she wants to show off to Aunt Maud that she has this amazing, rich, beautiful, vibrant, fun little friend. She sort of wants to show Aunt Maud that she achieved something that Aunt Maud didn't. Of course, then there's a little bit of a conflict because turns out there's a parallel and Aunt Maud has as her little trophy or toy or baby doll, let's call them, uh, Kate Croy. And of course, we find that Aunt Maud has a suitor in mind for Kate Croy. It is not Burton Densher. And then things start to take that turn toward the overarching theme and question of the book when Millie visits a doctor and may be very ill. And James has such a great propensity and skill for ambiguity. Things that can be frustratingly ambiguous at first, you should stick with it. Don't let that put you off. It's by design. He will resolve for you. He does resolve everything that needs explicit resolving. Okay, so I'm going to skip over some things at that point, but all these little mini dramas start to spin up. And especially around who's carrying on secret liaisons, who is betrothed to who, who Aunt Maud wants. And Aunt Maud loves control and has this way about her of asserting dominance and being the master chess player. But all of these interactions, all of these constellations begin to just swirl. And James uses in his preference, <laughs> in his preface, the terminology of centers. And if we think about those, the way that I'm describing this, you know, he moves different pieces to the center. And all these different alliances start taking place. Some of them are aware of exactly what each other has in mind. Others are alliances that are still mired in respective subterfuge. All throughout this, Merton Densher and Kate Croy are trying to play this game right. And when Millie becomes a major variable, this is where in part two, you, or, or volume two, you realize that the whole point of volume one was that James was digging extremely deep and stable footings underwater for this beautiful bridge that he's going to put in place in volume two. When eventually the whole crew goes to Venice and Millie rents this enormous palace, this is when we start to reach that apex, or it could be called a, a collision, of everyone's respective plans. And there's so much plotting going on, and James's language meets the demands of all of these different plottings, just like a chess player who's already 80 moves ahead in his or her mind, that it just sucks you into the story. And you find yourself on a Saturday sitting in a chair for 10 hours straight, just turning page after page, and weighing every single word in your mind and trying to squeeze out 
as much from every word and every beautifully wrought sentence to get the nectar of what James is offering. And like I said, everyone's got these different plans and schemes and strategies and so on. But I would say that foremost, it's the outrageous plan that Kate Croy and Merton Dencher concoct involving Millie that's the driving force of the novel's ultimate drama and power. And that in the very end answers that question of how can we die knowing that we have lived? All right, before we get to some highlights of the text proper, I'll give you some things that are also in the preface. James eventually considered The Wings of the Dove one of his more advanced works and thus belonged to the beef and potatoes of his essential canon after which one might only then rightfully taste the dessert or tarts of his shorter tales. The idea, says James, reduced to its essence, is that of a young person conscious of a great capacity for life, but early stricken and doomed, condemned to die under short respite, while also enamored of the world. Aware, moreover, of the condemnation and passionately desiring to put in before extinction, as many of the finer vibrations as possible, and so achieve, however briefly and brokenly, the sense of having lived. And here he, for the first time, I believe, refers to himself as a poet at this point in his life. He says, the way grew straight from the moment one recognized that the poet essentially can't be concerned with the act of dying. Let him deal with the sickest of the sick. It is still by the act of living that they appeal to him, and appeal the more as the conditions plot against them and prescribe the battle. And then he refers to getting at the soul of drama, and he says that that is the portrayal of a catastrophe determined in spite of oppositions. The enjoyment of a work of art, says James, the acceptance of an irresistible illusion constituting, to my sense, our highest experience of luxury. The luxury is not greatest by my consequent measure when the work asks for as little attention as possible. It is greatest. It is delightfully, divinely great when we feel the surface, like the thick ice of the skater's pond, bare without cracking the strongest pressure we throw on it. The sound of the crack one may recognize but never, surely, to call it a luxury. And so here, James is clearly an esthete like Ruskin or Pater. All right, so let's go through some highlights. Opening sentence. I love reading James's different opening sentences. And right from the start, you get a sense of his prose style that's going to carry on throughout the rest of the book. She waited, Kate Croy, for her father to come in. But he kept her unconscionably, and there were moments at which she showed herself, in the glass over the mantel, a face positively pale with the irritation that had brought her to the point of going away without sight of him. And so you can see that there is already a deliberate slowing down of pace enforced by the grammar, all those appositives and subordinate clauses. He might have awaited her on the sofa in his sitting room, or might have stayed in bed and received her in that situation. She was glad to be spared the sight of such penetralia, but it would have reminded her a little less that there was no truth in him. <laughs> and uh, I like that, and I read it because that penetralia is uh, that word that I first encountered her. It might have been penetralium or penetralium uh, in that form, at the opening of Wuthering Heights, which we'll get to eventually in the Western Core series. Here's Kate Croy. She held that she had a right to sadness and stillness. She nursed them for their postponing power. What they mainly postponed was the question of a surrender, though she couldn't yet have said exactly of what. A general surrender of everything? That was at moments the way it presented itself to Aunt Maud's looming personality. It was by her personality that Aunt Maud was prodigious, and the great mass of it loomed because in the thick, the fog-like air of her arranged existence, 
there were parts doubtless magnified, and parts certainly vague. They represented at all events alike, the dim and the distinct, a strong will and a high hand. It was perfectly present to Kate that she might be devoured, and she compared herself to a trembling kid, kept apart a day or two till her turn should come, but sure sooner or later to be introduced into the cage of the lioness. Just a beautiful description of uh, setting us up to encounter Aunt Maud, but I love some of these descriptors that James comes up with. He says that Aunt Maud was prodigious. Okay, that's pretty succinct. We're used to that from literature. But then he goes on to say, and the great mass of it loomed because in the thick, the fog-like air of her arranged existence. That is, there were parts doubtless magnified and parts certainly vague. Here we're introduced to Kate Croy's sister, Marion Croy, or Mrs. Condrip. She's gotten married, but she's now widowed, and she has all these noisy, rambunctious kids. It's just a, a terrible situation that represents something that Kate Croy is clearly not interested in succumbing to, and hence what pushes her to try to please Aunt Maud and inherit some kind of fortune from, not necessarily directly from Aunt Maud's deep pockets, but from her arrangements of the proper suitor. But anyway, Mr. Condrip's widow, again, uh, Kate Croy's sister, expansively obscured that image. She was little more than a ragged relic, a plain, prosaic result of him, as if she had somehow been pulled through him as through an obstinate funnel, only to be left crumpled and useless, and with nothing in her but what he accounted for. I just, I love these formulations that James comes up with. As if she had somehow been pulled through him, as through an obstinate funnel, only to be left crumpled and useless. This is about Merton Densher. He was perhaps at the same time too much in his mere senses for poetry, and yet too little in them for art. Maybe that's what we have to achieve to appreciate James. We have to be in this balance between those two. So, whereas Merton Densher is too much in his senses for poetry, yet too little in them for art, we have to find that balance of our sensibilities. You would have got fairly near him by making out in his eyes the potential recognition of ideas, but you would have quite fallen away again on the question of the ideas themselves. Just love the way that James describes and introduces us to his characters. You, you can't really find it anywhere else. The innumerable ways of making money were, no doubt, at all events, what his imagination often was busy with after he had tilted his chair and thrown back his head with his hands clasped behind it. What would most have prolonged that attitude, moreover, was the reflection that the ways were ways only for others. So Merton Densher thinks about these things, but not very deeply, and he's sort of resigned from achieving great fortunes. He's settled and comfortable with what he's got. And that struck a chord with me too, because that's how I feel. I don't, I don't have that entrepreneurial drive within me. I don't need power and I don't need money. Those aren't motivating factors for me. And, you know, I hear about all these people, crazy uh, fortunes they amass and all this stuff. And I just, it's just like, like Merton Densher. I can sit there and my reflection would be that those ways were ways for others only. Listen to just more of these descriptions. So almost abnormally affirmative. So aggressively erect were the huge, heavy objects that syllabled his hostess's story. He hadn't known, and in spite of Kate's repeated reference to her own rebellions of taste, that he should mind so much how an independent lady might decorate her house. It was the language of the house itself that spoke to him, writing out for him with surpassing breadth and freedom, the associations and conceptions, the ideals and possibilities of the mistress. 
He couldn't describe and dismiss them collectively, call them either mid-Victorian or early, not being certain they were rangeable under one rubric. It was only manifest they were splendid and were furthermore conclusively British. They constituted an order and abounded in rare material, precious woods, metals, stuffs, stones. He had never dreamed of anything so fringed and scalloped, so buttoned and corded, drawn everywhere so tight and curled everywhere so thick. He had never dreamed of so much gilt and glass, so much satin and plush, so much rosewood and marble and malachite. This is an amazing description of this very British interior of a house, but pulled through, to use a Jamesian word, pulled through that constellation of consciousness of Merton Densher. It goes on, but it was above all the solid forms, the wasted finish, the misguided cost, the general attestation of morality and money, a good conscience and a big balance. These things finally presented for him a portentous negation of his own world of thought, of which, for that matter, in the presence of them, he became, as for the first time, hopelessly aware. They revealed it to him by their merciless difference. And then finally, James pulls the constellations of Merton Densher and Aunt Maud into close proximity, and we get these two sentences. What he must use his fatal intelligence for was to resist. Mrs. Louder, or Aunt Maud, meanwhile, might use it for whatever she liked. Once in any degree admit that, and your pride and prejudice will take care of the rest. The pride fed full, meanwhile, by the system she means to practice with you, and the prejudice excited by the comparisons she'll enable you to make, from which I shall come off badly. And this is, of course, Kate and Merton talking in reference to Aunt Maud. But it was nonetheless charming to make his confession to a woman. Women had, in fact, for such differences, blessedly more imagination and blessedly more symphony. And I think that describes exactly why, for almost the entirety of James's career, he was so obsessed with the female sentiment. And then we get introduced to Millie Thiel. New York was vast. New York was startling, with strange histories, with wild, cosmopolite background generations that accounted for anything. And to have got nearer the luxuriant tribe of which the rare creature was the final flower, that being Millie Thiel, and this is from the constellation of Susan Singer, by the way, the immense, extravagant, unregulated cluster with free living ancestors, handsome dead cousins, lurid uncles, beautiful vanished aunts, persons all busts and curls, preserved, though so exposed, in the marble of famous French chisels. All this, to say nothing of the effect of closer growths of the stem, was to have had one's small world space both crowded and enlarged. And she goes on to talk about an ugly smutch upon perfection. What a wonderful word. You can hear James saying that out loud, smutch. And a couple of times in his preference, he says a word and says, oh, I quite love that word. And he refers to Europe as the great American sedative, as he begins to set up the Americans to go and immerse themselves uh, with the Europeans. And it was just a part, likewise, that while plates were changed and dishes presented and periods in the banquet marked, while appearances insisted and phenomena multiplied and words reached her from here and there like plashes of a slow, thick tide. I love that word, plash. While Mrs. Louder, Aunt Maud, grew somehow more stout and more instituted, and Susie, Susan Stringer, 
at her distance and in comparison, more thinly improvised and more different, different, that is, from everyone and everything, it was just a part that while this process went forward, our young lady, Millie, alighted, came back, taking up her destiny again as if she had been able by a wave or two of her wings to place herself briefly in sight of an alternative to it. Here, James brings Kate Croy into proximity with Lord Mark, but also then Millie as well. It was the handsome girl alone, meaning Kate, one of his species and his own society, Lord Marx, who had made him feel uncertain. Of his certainties about a mere little American, a cheap, exotic, imported, almost wholesale, and whose habitat, with its conditions of climate, growth, and cultivation, its immense profusion, but its few varieties and thin development, talking about Millie, he was perfectly satisfied. The marvel was, too, that Millie understood his satisfaction, feeling she expressed the truth in presently saying, Of course, I make out that she must be difficult, meaning Kate, just as I see that I myself must be easy. And so Millie here is resting in the status of the simple American girl versus the complex and refined British beauty that Kate Croy represents. Here we get a glimpse at the aesthetics of British literature. The conscious sinking at all events and the awfully good manner, the difference, the bridge, the interval, the skipped leaves of the social atlas, these, it was to be confessed, had a little, for our young lady, in default of stouter stuff, to work themselves into the light literary legend, a mixed wandering echo of Trollope, of Thackeray, perhaps mostly of Dickens, under favor of which her pilgrimage had so much appealed. So this is the, what's happening here is we're getting a description of Millie's mental screen or mental idea of British society and British culture that has been developed for her, constructed for her, through the aesthetics of British literature such as Trollope and Thackeray and Dickens. Mrs. Stringham. Oh man, have I been saying Susan Stringer or Stringer? <laughs> Great. This whole time it's Susan Stringer, not String. I mean, it's Susan Stringham, not Stringer. Oh boy. I'm not going back and editing and trying to voice over that stuff, so I apologize. Mrs. Stringham in the Midnight Conference intimated rather yearningly that, however the event might have turned, the side of English life such experiences opened to Millie were just those she herself seemed booked, as they were all round about her now, always saying to miss, in other words, the having her idea of British society booked means that it's been imparted to her through books, and Susan Stringham is really excited to have that interruption or corruption, maybe, that skewing of what it's really like, righted or calibrated by her actually being there. And then I got to this part here, and this sentence says, Susan Shepherd perceived in this explanation such signs of an appetite for motive as would have sat gracefully even on one of her own New England heroines. And when I thought about this, this is uh, Susan Shepard, Susan uh, Stringham. It's Susan Shepard Stringham. <laughs> but when I read this, it clicked that just as Millie is living life through a reader's eyes, Susan is also doing sort of the same thing, but she's living life through her writer's eyes. So there's a screen of artifice either way. Crude elation, however, might be kept at bay, and the circumstance nonetheless made clear that they were all swimming together in the blue. It came back to Lord Mark again, as he seemed slowly to pass and repass, and conveniently to linger before them. He was personally the note of the blue, like a suspended skein of silk within reach of the broiderer's hand. Aunt Maud's 
free-moving shuttle took a length of him at rhythmic intervals, and one of the accessory truths that flickered across to Millie was that he ever so consentingly knew he was being worked in. Okay, beautiful. Beautiful example of what James does so well. James is moving the story forward. He's enriching the proximity of constellations, the psychological depth between all the characters. But he's also just using such wonderful language, such wonderful visualization, figurative writing, but language to it as well, that you get all these things wrapped up together. Listen to this, just this descriptive, this quick little descriptive of Millie in London. Young, beautiful, American, sentimented Millie in London. Almost said Lily in London. I think that's called a spoonerism, right? Once more, things melted together. The beauty and the history and the facility and the splendid midsummer glow. It was a sort of magnificent maximum. The pink dawn of an apotheosis coming so curiously soon. There was an accepted spell in the sense that nobody in the world knew where she was. It was the first time in her life that this had happened. Somebody, everybody, appeared to have known before, at every instant of it, where she was, so that she was now suddenly able to put it to herself that that hadn't been a life. This present kind of thing, therefore, might be. And so we're starting to see Millie spreading her wings, shaking off her fetters, asserting her individuality, discovering liberty and freedom even in the face of possible death. Here's a scene of Kate Croy sort of airing things or venting things to Millie and the start of their friendship and relationship that's, of course, for us only spelling disaster in the future. But listen to how this is written by James. She went at them just now, these sources of irritation, with an amused energy that it would have been open to Millie to regard as cynical and that was nonetheless called for. As to this, the other was distinct by the way that in certain connections the American mind broke down. It seemed, at least, the American mind as sitting there thrilled and dazzled in Millie, not to understand English society without a separate confrontation with all the cases. It couldn't proceed by, there was some technical term she lacked until Millie suggested both analogy and induction, and then, differently, instinct, none of which were right. It had to be led up and introduced to each aspect of the monster, enabled to walk all round it, whether for the consequent exaggerated ecstasy or for the still more, as appeared to this critic, dis disproportionate shock. It might, the monster, Kate conceded, loom large for those born amid forms less developed and therefore no doubt less amusing. It might on some sides be a strange and dreadful monster calculated to devour the unwary, to abase the proud, to scandalize the good, but if one had to live with it, one must, not to be forever sitting up, learn how, which was virtually in short tonight what the handsome girl showed herself as teaching. So again, just the way this is written, I hope you're getting a sense of how James, picture again those nodes of all the characters and their constellation of interior projection, their projection of consciousnesses. I hope you get a sense of how he sort of offsets the narration and description away from the character proper and into those fields or waves of consciousness. He's telling instead of showing, yes, but from a slightly off kilter or from a slant of consciousness. This is Kate talking of Millie. You can do anything. You can do, I mean, lots that we, British women, can't. You're an outsider, independent and standing by yourself. You're not hideously relative to tears and tears of others. T-I-E-R-S. Okay, and then we finally, as we're rounding out volume one, 
we get the central metaphor, the titular metaphor. And this is also a, an epiphany that Kate has of Millie. This unexpectedly had acted by a sudden turn of Kate's attitude as a happy speech. She had risen as she spoke, and Kate had stopped before her, shining at her instantly with a softer brightness. Poor Millie hereby enjoyed one of her views of how people, wincing oddly, were often touched by her. Because you're a dove, Kate says, with which she felt herself ever so delicately, so considerately embraced, not with familiarity or as a liberty taken, but almost ceremonially and in the manner of an accolade, partly as if, though a dove who could perch on a finger, one were also a princess with whom forms were to be observed. It even came to her through the touch of her companion's lips that this form, this cool pressure, fairly sealed the sense of what Kate had just said. It was moreover for the girl like an inspiration. She found herself accepting as the right one while she caught her breath with relief, the name so given her. She met it on the instant as she would have met revealed truth. It lighted up the strange dusk in which she lately had walked. That was what was the matter with her. She was a dove. Oh, wasn't she? It echoed within her as she became aware of the sound outside of the return of their friends. So after this little scene of bringing their constellations into very close proximity, introducing an epiphany for both Kate and Millie, James then tears them back apart or pulls those constellations back apart by bringing others over into the proximity. It's like all these atoms swirling about, uh, kind of like well, the, the swerve from Lucretius or something. This is uh, James's De Rerum Natura. James does such a great job presenting coy repartee. He had said to her more than once, even before his absence, you keep the key of the cupboard, and I foresee that when we're married, you'll dole me out my sugar by lumps. She had replied that she rejoiced in his assumption that sugar would be his diet. <laughs> I just, I love that. The women one meets, what are they but books one has already read? You're a whole library of the unknown, the uncut. And I love that so much that I've decided to outright plagiarize it, present it as my own in my wife's Valentine's Day card this year. Here's Millie and Susan Shepard Stringham. She might have been disappointed, but she had her good humor. He tells me to live. And she oddly limited the word. It left Susie a little at sea. Then what more do you want? My dear, the girl presently said, I don't want, as I assure you, anything. Still, she added, I am living. Oh yes, I'm living. And what this all intimates to me is that old saying, and it's been attributed to a few different people, but life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. So Millie is trying to say that you know, here I am, you know, trying to make sure that if the end does come swiftly, I have lived. But I can't just also sit around and be kind of stuck in this stage of wanting and trying to figure out because that sand through the hourglass is still emptying out. Sometimes James, his opening paragraphs are to sections, to chapters, are just so lovingly crafted. And listen to all of the consonants and assonance as well. Uh, there, there's, this is poetry. Not yet so much as this morning had she felt herself sunk into possession, gratefully glad. It's kind of like stately plump, just came to my mind. Stately plump buck mulligan. Anyway, gratefully glad that the warmth of the southern summer was still in the high floored rooms, palatial chambers where hard, cool pavements took reflections in their lifelong polish. Wow. 
and where the sun on the stirred seawater flickering up through open windows played over the painted subjects in the splendid ceilings. Medallions of purple and brown, of brave old melancholy color, medals as of old reddened gold, embossed and beribboned, all toned with time and all flourished and scalloped and gilded about, set in their great molded and figured concavity, a nest of white cherubs, friendly creatures of the air, and appreciated by the aid of that second tier of smaller lights, straight openings to the front, which did everything, even with the baydeckers and photographs of Millie's partly dreadfully meeting the eye, to make of the place an apartment of state. As we continue to move towards that rising action, a character says, one can't do more than live. And then again, one can't, as I tell you, do more than live. And so James, while we're already grappling with the question of how to live or how at the time of death to know one has lived, we now from, I think it was Lord Mark, get the proposition that one can't do more than just simply live. And it continues, if you can't get the right thing, who can in all the world, I should like to know. Because again, this is James's ideal or quintessential figure, Millie Thiel, for this dilemma. So in other words, Millie is our only hope to answer this question. He was mixed up in her fate, and I'm skipping over some of the plot points to avoid spoilers. He was mixed up in her fate, or her fate, if that should be better, was mixed up in him, so that a single false motion might either way snap the coil. They helped him, it was true, these considerations, to a degree of eventual peace. For what they luminously amounted to was that he was to do nothing, and that fell in, after all, with the burden laid on him by Kate. He was not only to budge without the girl's leave, not, oddly enough, at the last, to move without it, whether further or nearer, any more than without Kate's. It was to this his wisdom reduced itself, to the need, again, simply to be kind. That was the same as being still, as studying to create the minimum of vibration. And even though you may not know exactly the situation that's completely going on here, I hope you can hear the beautiful language, just this master prose that James contrives to describe it. There's drama in the very words he chooses. Another great section opener. The near Thursday, coming nearer and bringing Sir Luke Strett, the doctor, brought also, blessedly, an abatement of other rigors. The weather changed the stubborn storm yielded, and the autumn sunshine baffled for many days. But now hot and almost vindictive came into its own again, and with an almost audible paean, a suffusion of bright sound that was one with the bright color, took large possession. Venice glowed and plashed and culled and chimed again. The air was like a clap of hands and the scattered pinks, yellows, blues, sea greens were like a hanging out of vivid stuffs, a laying down of fine carpets. This is from the perspective of Merton Dencher towards the end. He had nothing to do but to wait. His main support really was his original idea, which didn't leave him, of waiting for the deepest depth his predicament could sink to. Fate would invent, if he but gave it time, some refinement of the horrible. All right, so I'm going to stop there. And at this point, I'm going to offer some spoilers. So if you don't want the spoilers, go ahead and turn the video off. I hope you enjoyed what you've seen so far. Now, for me, like I said, I think the whole answer that James gives is that to have loved and to have been loved in return is the way that we can die confident knowing that we have lived. 
And this is what largely drives the crazy plan between Kate Croy and Merton Densher. But of course, Densher's, well, how should I say, Densher's dissimulation gives way to genuine feelings. And the final scenes where Millie left a letter for Merton Densher, Merton Densher never reads the letter. He gives it to Kate, who reads it and then tosses it into the fire. But James isn't interested in simply answering the question that has loomed over the whole novel. He gives us this final moment where, for all of their ploying and scheming, Merton Densher turns around and gives Kate an ultimatum. And the ultimatum is the stuff of great literature. It's the stuff of Jean Valjean's dilemma of stealing bread while it's also feeding his poor family. Here, Densher basically establishes an ultimatum that won't allow the relationship between he and Kate to move forward unless it's built on true love and not money. But Kate has also recognized the power of Millie, or rather her memory, over Densher. And the conclusion that both of them come to and that's stated in the very last line of the novel for us readers is that we shall never again be as we were. Everybody, because of the dove Millie Thiel, is indelibly changed, including we readers. While I don't prescribe The Wings of the Dove as a starting point for someone new to Henry James, I do hope that you will take time at some point to read his late masterpieces, The Ambassadors, Wings of the Dove, The Golden Bowl, and experience a literature so rich and so of a different time in our literary history and learn how to cultivate your palate and enjoy its more difficult pleasures. And I use difficult in contrast to easier pleasures. There's a delayed gratification. There's work that has to be done, like eating around the fine bones of a fish that makes the overall endeavor very, very pleasurable. Henry James has a craft. He is the master of it. And I hope this video has done something to put him on your radar. And thank you once again to Jeff for pushing me to read this wonderful, wonderful late masterpiece.